Dr. Reinald, um, she's one of us. Um, well, many of us on the call anyway. She's a certified um, industrial hygienist or occupational hygienist, a registered occupational hygienist in Canada. And she evaluates and applies mathematical exposure models to, to estimate exposures in a novel occupational environment. She's the co-founder and director of the University of Minnesota Exposure Sciences Sustainability um, Institute. She also teaches in the industrial hygiene program offered within the Division of Environmental Health Sciences, the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. And what really piqued my interest um, with Dr. Arnold was this team that she's on where uh, a number of academics have actually uh, designed and, and built, like made, manufactured um, face cover that, um, or a, a face mask that's kind of approaching um, a respiratory protective equipment. But um, I'll just hand that over to you now, Dr. Arnold, and you can take off from there. Thanks. Okay, super. Well, th and Kevin, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to both you and Marianne for the introduction. And thank you, Dr. McIntyre, for that amazing presentation. I mean, the information in and of itself was just so helpful and, and such a rich presentation, but um, it's also a wonderful background for what I'm going to talk about. And that, so I feel like we've just kind of had the, the you know, kind of the, the universe, the overview of what we know about SARS-CoV-2 and sadly some of the failures, you know, some of the just reluctance to accept the science, reluctance to allow the scientists with the appropriate knowledge to lead and to influence policy. Um, right, right now with this presentation, we're sort of gonna drop down, I guess from, you know, kind of 20,000 feet to uh, ground level. This is very much a boots on the ground kind of story. And again, I, I, I'm really, um, really touched by your presentation because I feel like you've communicated the angst that we have all been feeling as industrial hygienists. And I think it was abundantly apparent to most of us very early on that, um, you know, surgical masks, that it just the haphazard approach, the, the old um, belief system, there were just so many reasons why the, the response was inadequate. And, and we knew this, we, need, we knew that in fact, N95s should have been the floor, not the ceiling. Um, and, and so that was, certainly was true for me. And I was feeling a lot of kind of conflict because you know, respiratory protection isn't the main focus of my academic research. I'm industrial hygienist by training. Um, my expertise and research centers around exposure assessment, but you know, I, I do know something about respiratory protection. And when I saw um, the call for help within my own university and saw that there were some amazing researchers stepping up, but, but I wasn't sure if anyone with industrial hygiene training um, was part of that team, I reached out to the director of the Institute for Engineering and Medicine, who had been tapped by our medical school, um, had more medical, medical school, and one of the leaders of the healthcare system to respond or to help them respond. Um, anyway, when I reached out and asked that question, he said, congratulations, you're on the team. And so um, this institute led this response. And, and so this is um, a story about how one of the teams of teams uh, or teams within the team responded to an urgent need. So as, um, just as an outline, I just want to talk about, again, a little bit of background context and then uh, tell you a little bit about the interdisciplinary rapid response team that was formed because I, I, I really believe that that was, uh, was pivotal in, our, um, in the success of our mission. I think it's also a really important, it's really kind of a success story that is indicative of the way we need to move forward. Um, and, and certainly in our academic um, research, but beyond that as well. But I, I'm going to describe to you the process that we followed in designing and developing and evaluating the MN mask style three, and then give you some information uh, about the um, 
the availability of the design and materials to make the mask. So as I'm sure you'll all recall, um, early, last, early at the beginning of this year, just as um, concerns were increasing and spreading across the globe, many of the manufacturers of the, of the uh, personal protective equipment, including respirators, that were located in China were shutting down. A lot of workplaces closed in an effort to slow the spread of this virus. And unfortunately that included um, makers of PPE, just as the global demand for the, the respirators and other items was escalating. And so you know, there was an acute, uh, acute shortage of PPE. And in fact, our own healthcare system uh, that's affiliated with the University of Minnesota uh, had some projected shortages. So, you know, everything from N95 respirators down to shoe covers. And so this is where the Institute for Engineering and Medicine was tapped or IEM. And the leader of uh, IEM then set up this kind of overarching team and then teams, um, sub teams under this larger umbrella. And so um, my team was uh, comprised of the four people you see here. Three, three of us are academic researchers and uh, one is a colleague who's an industrial hygienist and works in the department of eh and um, on our campus. So we had uh, an electrical engineer, a biomedical engineer, myself as an industrial hygienist and then a practicing industri industrial hygienist. Um, Dr. Franklin has expertise in designing and making uh, electronic electric sensors, and Dr. Bechtold uh, designs and makes medical devices. So we have these uh, researchers with this amazing training and experience in rapidly developing prototypes, um, and even just just really practical experience, like where to source things, how to very quickly evaluate the cost, um, you know, the cost of having a three inch nose band versus a four inch nose band, uh, where to get them, um, who to talk to on campus to have something modified. Uh, and I, I should mention that uh, where I, I knew Neil prior to our, uh, our team being brought together, I had never met Dr. Franklin or Dr. Beck told. So we met for the first time virtually at the end of March um, and our, our introductory meeting was a Zoom call with me providing some fundamentals of respiratory protection to these two women. And uh, we went from that first meeting to having our product ready in six weeks. So it was really a remarkable, uh, there was a rem remarkable chemistry and you know, united by this urgent mission. Um, we were led by Dr. Franklin. She just had phenomenal, um, phenomenal communication skills and dedication. I mean, it, it was a very intense effort. So as you'll all know, as industrial hygienists, one of the critical factors to uh, respiratory protection being effective is having effective filtration. And of course, we all know that practically speaking, the material that is used to filter has to be, um, we have to be able to breathe through it. So the resistance can't be too great. And uh, again, having some knowledge of these particulars um, was able to influence the group and leverage some resources that we have on our campus. So we have the Hui Filtration Lab and one of the local companies that's a very large company, but the, one of the local um, um, entities within this umbrella company makes diesel engine filters. And they donated a quantity of their material to us to see if it might have application in this, you know, to meet our need. So we were able to test the filtration uh, efficiency of the material across a range of particle sizes, as you can see in the figure here on the right, and also to um, 
to measure the resistance of this material. So I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, um, but this EX103 material is, the, is actually the material that we worked with. And you, and let's see, I think if, I, if we focus on the most penetrating particle size, 0.3 microns, you can see that we, we are almost achieving or maybe just a little bit above 98% efficiency with the filtration. Um, the EX101 is a little bit better. And as a benchmark for comparison, this black um, line with the inverted triangles is uh, showing you the efficiency of, an, of the material used to make N95 respirators. So you can see that the, the test materials are not quite as efficient, but they're not too far off. Um, you'll note here on the lower left of this figure that the, um, uh, sorry, over uh, what am I here? The um, resistance of the um, the N, of the N95 mask is a lot lower than these other two materials, and this is um, due to the electret material, the, and the nature of the, that electret property of the N95, which the the Cummins materials don't have. So there is more resistance, but they are still below that. Um, Oops, sorry, that criteria is set by NIOSH, so they're less than 343 pascals. So given this performance, we felt that the, um, the filtration was sufficient and the resistance was acceptable. And so we, uh, we used the AX103 for our product. Um, I should mention here that, so I'm, that this mask is called the MN Mask Style 3 there were three different styles being developed with three different target audiences or tar target um, users. Um, and our, so our mask was being developed for, um, potentially for use in healthcare, but the idea was that it would be used in areas that were deemed at lower risk and, and, and it's kind of, you know, kind of interesting thinking about that in lieu of what Dr. McIntyre was saying, but at that time there really was this notion that you know the COVID floors represented a greater risk to those healthcare workers versus healthcare workers that were on other floors. Early on in the pandemic, then that probably was true. I mean, community community infectivity was a lot lower. Um, I think we'd have a hard time making that harder time making that case right now. But anyway, our mission was not to develop an N95 respirator. Um, however, being an industrial hygienist and having the opinion that the N95s really ought to have been our minimal, minimally acceptable level of personal protective equipment, um, I got agreement with by my team to strive for a level of performance that was as high as we could get it. Um, so we were striving to be as close to an N95 as we could. Um, you probably also remember last March when we, when we first started this project, um, there were shortages of so many things. So not just personal protective equipment, but just a lot of everyday materials. And given that, um, current situation of sh many shortages and we not knowing how long the shortages would last or whether they would recur, we thought it was important to de design this mask to uh, use as few materials as possible and to make sure that the materials that we were using were currently readily sourceable within the U.S. Uh, we also set as a performance or sorry as a design objective that um, if possible, we wanted to come up with a process for making the masks that didn't require highly specialized or really expensive equipment um, with a high level of expertise. And then of course, we wanted to design for comfort and fit and, and you know, fit and recognition that that was going to be a significant factor in the overall performance um, of the mask in terms of protection. 
uh, or should, should just mention here. So the materials you see in this image are what goes into making the MN mask. So the, the AX103, the nose band, the elastic band and staples. Um, we found through our prototype process that the stapled design was preferable to the sewn design. Um, we think partly because it just puts less, puts fewer puncture holes into that media. Um, okay, and as industrial hygienists, of course, we know that for tight fitting masks, it's, it's all about that seal around the face. Um, so we conducted quantitative fit testing using a port account. Um, and again, I think you're pretty familiar with how it works. We measure the air outside the mask and the, count the particles in that air, simultaneously measuring the particles inside the mask and calculate the fit factor. Um, as Dr. McIntyre mentioned, if there are spaces around the face or if there are gaps between the skin and the, the mask, then we're going to have leakage. We'll get air moving in and out and with it any particles, including infectious particles that are in that air. Um, for reference, the fit factor must be greater than 100 for that user, to, user mask combination to pass. Um, we also quantitatively fit tested a small number of the surgical procedural masks and we found that depending on the design and different manufacturers and the person, we had fit factors ranging from 3.9 to 39. Uh, okay, so once we were able to navigate the Institutional Review Board, uh, who would have thought fit testing would have caused a major, <laughs> some major process? But lo and behold, when you when you do fit testing for research purposes, it's it's an entirely different animal. Anyway, uh, the Institutional Review Board at the University of Minnesota did give us permission to conduct this study. We recruited ten volunteers. Um, adult volunteers with varying face shapes, face shape size, and nose bridge characteristics. So the idea here is that we really wanted to get a sense of um, were there were there people for whom the mask provided you know better protection, and were there people who just weren't going to see a very high level of protection. Um, and that would be useful both for providing guidance on the use of this particular mask as well as for the ongoing design work um, that is continuing here. So we had each volunteer wear three masks. We followed the um, TSI fast filtering face piece respirator fit test method and um, and conducted the quantitative fit testing. Um, we found that a key determinant of fit was the nose bridge characteristics and not really surprising, but um, consistent with what we see with N90, with N95 fit testing. Um, so the table just shows you the overall results. We had an N of 30 uh, overall, the range of fit test scores um, spanned from 2.8 to uh, 200. Um, the overall mean score was 53, but as we break, if we broke, as we broke that out um, between people with narrow or really flat nose bridges versus people with wide, well-defined nose bridges, we saw a significant difference in the fit factors. Um, I think, you know, based on a kind of a precautionary basis, if we focus on the minimum scores, we see that for the wide nose bridge, people having wider nose bridges. Um, wearing this mask would offer, again, not as good as an N95, but certainly better than what is typical with a surgical procedural mask. For people with the narrower nose bridge, this particular design um, is, is going to be more in the range of what they'd see with a surgical or procedural mask. So certainly a lower level of protection. But again, um, for people that are you know, needing something higher, more protective than a cloth mask, um, and certainly in situations where the N95s aren't attainable, this particular version could 
help bridge that gap until the N95s or the elastomerics are available. Um, so in terms of the project outcome, as I mentioned earlier, we went from you know, introducing one another and uh, starting our design to having a finished product in six weeks. Uh, the design of the mask is available through an open license agreement at our university and the link on the slide will take you to that site. Um, and then navigating that agreement also gives you further instructions on uh, where you can source some of the materials, but I also wanted to include this link here. So the Cummin Cummins uh, has made um, um, quantities of the EX101 material, so the, that material that's a little bit better than what we used, available, and they've cut it to size for our mask design. And the cost, I think they sell it in, in, in quantities of 50 rectangles, so enough to make 50 masks. Um, and the, the, the media costs a little bit more, a little bit less than a dollar a mask. So it is available if this is um, something that you, you think would be useful to your folks. Okay, and just in wrapping up, there were, this was a multi interdisciplinary team and lots of additional people were, um, were supporting us um, besides the Institute for Engineering and Medicine and the School of Public Health and the Exposure Science and Sustainability Institute. We had uh, excellent support from the Pui Filtration Lab and Dr. Pui's doctoral students uh, from my lab. Uh, we had media donated by Cummins and then TSI actually donated the port account to us um, some time ago. So I want to uh, give them a huge shout out for, for that uh, support. And with that, um, so I guess I go go back, but with that, if there are any questions, be happy to field them at this point. 